today's priest uh, brown bag. We're delighted to have you here today. I think we've got a special guest uh, with a lecture that I think you're going to uh, really enjoy. I want to uh, begin by uh, thanking Norman Saul, I'll embarrass him publicly, for uh, the use of the Saul Fund, which allows us to bring in regional scholars, uh, folks from uh, you know, the neighborhood, uh, in order to talk at priest brown bags and other uh, lectures. Uh, we have today uh, Benjamin Peters, who is a uh, media historian and theorist. Uh, he's an assistant professor of communication at the University of Tulsa and the author of the book, How Not to Network a Nation, The Uneasy History of the Soviet Internet. Uh, Todd Gitlin of the uh, uh, Columbia, uh, he's the chair of uh, communications there, has said of this book, Benjamin Peters' book is not only a scintillating explanation of why the Soviet Internet failed to materialize, but also a first-rate socio-political investigative report and a delicious tale of how Soviet efforts to manage the command economy left them without either command or an economy. <laughs> uh, he is, uh, Dr. Peters is also the editor of Digital Keywords, a vocabulary of information society and culture, and he writes broadly on critical uh, information studies, new media history, uh, global networks, with emphasis on Slavic and Western culture. And I was delighted to hear on the walk up here that he's actually took, taken part in our uh, Lviv uh, study abroad program uh, several years back, so Great. happy to have you back. I'm thrilled to be back. Thank you so much, Bart, and thanks everybody for coming out. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, I, it really is a treat to be in a place that I have a transcript, but I've never actually set foot before, <laughs> even doubly so that I'm only a few hours away. So I, I look forward to you, um, getting to know you and, um, and enjoying the, the short the short distances that the Midwest offers. Um, so what I'd like to offer today is, as suggested, a kind of dramatic distillation of the book project. I, I um, have worked hard to try to present something that I could read that I thought would actually be worth listening to. Um, and then, uh, then the rest of it will just be candid questions where I hope you pin me down and we can uh, discuss, it, discuss something more scholarly. Um, and uh, let me actually pass this around too, in case people haven't had a chance to see the book itself yet. OK, so I'll just hop in. Um, on the morning of the 1st of October, 1970, the computer scientist Viktor Glushkov, um, yeah, on a version of this book, uh, Viktor Glushkov walked into the Kremlin to meet with the Politburo. He was an alert man with piercing eyes rimmed in black glasses with the kind of mind that, given one problem, would uh, derive a method for solving all similar problems. And at that moment, the Soviet Union had a, had a serious problem. A year earlier, the United States had launched the ARPANET, uh, the first packet switch to distributed uh, computer network uh, uh, that would in time see the internet as we know it today. Distributed network was uh, originally designed to nudge the U.S. ahead of the Soviets, allowing for scientists and government leaders um, their computers at least to communicate in the event of a nuclear attack. Here's the 1964 report from Paul Barron. And it was the height of the tech race, and the Soviets needed to respond. Glushkov's idea was to inaugurate an era of electronic socialism. He named the colossally ambitious project the All-State Automated System, or It sought to streamline and technologically upgrade the entire planned economy, and this system would still make economic decisions by plan, not market price, uh, uh, but would be sped up by computer modeling um, to predict equilibria before they happened. Glushkov wanted smarter and faster decision making, but maybe and maybe even electronic currency. All he needed was the Politburo's purse. When Glushkov entered the, that cavernous room that morning, he noticed two empty chairs on the long table. This is not the actual uh, room, but it's my closest. Uh, his two strongest allies were in fact missing. Instead, he faced down a table of ambitious, steely-eyed ministers, many of whom wanted the Politburo's purse and support from themselves. More broadly, between 1959 and 1989, leading Soviet men and women of science and state repeatedly ventured to construct a computer network for broadly pro-social purposes. With the deep wounds of the Second World War far from healed, the Soviet Union continued to specialize in massive modernization projects that had transformed a dispersed Tsarist nation of a, uh, illiterate peasants into a global nuclear power in the course of a couple generations. After the Soviet 
uh, Union leaders Nikita Khrushchev denounced Stalin's personality cult in 1956. A sense of possibility seemed to sweep the country. And onto this scene entered a host of socialist projects to wire the national economy with networks, among them the first proposal anywhere in the world to create a national computer network for civilians. The idea was the brainchild of the military researcher Anatoly Ivanovich Kitov. Here he is, the far right, in visiting in Cambridge, um, Harvard campus. A young man with a small build and a keen mind for mathematics, Kitov had risen through the ranks of the Red Army in the Second World War. Then, in 1952, he had encountered Norbert Wiener's masterwork Cybernetics in a secret military library. The book title, A Neologism from the Greek for a Steersman, and the coiner of a post-war science of self-governing information systems. With the support of two senior scientists, Kitov translated cybernetics into a robust Russian language approach to developing self-governing control and communication systems within, with computers. And the supple systems vocabulary of cybernetics was intended to equip the Soviet state with a high-tech toolkit for rationalist Marxist governance, an antidote perhaps to the violence and cult of personality that had previously characterized Stalin's strongman state. Perhaps so the technocratic dream went and still goes today, cybernetics could help ensure that there would never be another dictator again. In 1959, as the director of the Secret Military uh, Computer Research Center, Kitov turned his attention to devoting unlimited quantities, quote, of reliable calculating processing power, unquote, to better planning, planning the national economy, which was perhaps the most persistent information coordination problem besetting the Soviet socialist project. It was discovered in 1962, for example, that a handmade calculation error in 1959 had actually goofed the population predictions by some four million people. So Kitov uh, wrote his thoughts down in what he called the Red Book Letter, which he then sent to Khrushchev. He proposed allowing, quote, civilian organizations to use functioning military computer complexes for economic planning in the nighttime hours when most military men were sleeping. Um, here, he thought economic planners could harness, this is in the fall, uh, roughly October of 1959, uh, he thought economic planners could harness the military's uh, computational surplus to adjust for census problems in real time, <coughs> thus tweaking the, nightly, uh, the economic plan nightly if needed. He named this simultaneously military and civilian uh, national computer network the Economic Automated Management System. And it, as it happens, Kitov's military supervisors intercepted the Red Book letter before it reached Khrushchev, a deviation from times past when he had reached. They were incensed, in fact, by his proposal that the Red Army share resources with civilian economic planners, resources that Kitov also dared to describe as falling behind the times. A secret military tribunal was arranged to review his transgressions, and for which Kitov was promptly stripped of his Communist Party membership for a year and then dismissed. Uh, from the military permanently. Thus ended the first national public computer network propose, ever proposed. The idea, however, survived. In the early 1960s, another scientist took up Kitov's proposal, a man whom Kitov would grow close enough to that decades later their children would marry, Viktor Mikhailovich Glushkov from the initial s vignette. The first title of Glushkov's plan, the All-State Automated System, for the gathering and processing of information for the accounting, planning, and governance of the national economy, USSR, speaks for itself and its epic ambitions. First proposed in 1962, the All-State Automated System, or OGAS, was intended to become a real-time, remote-access national computer network built on pre-existing and new telephony wires. In its most ambitious version, it would span the Eurasian continent, mapping itself like a nervous system onto every factory and enterprise in the planned economy. Uh, in, in its, again, in, the network was modeled hierarchically after the three-level pyramid structure of the state and economy. One, here I can show you another map uh, whose, there, oh, I, I appear to have be missing. There's an image that's not appearing, I apologize. I can show you later. It shows the, the hierarchical tiering um, of, of the network. Um, but as proposed, there would be one central computer center in Moscow uh, that would connect to as many as um, uh, 200 mid-level computer centers and major prominent uh, region centers, which would then turn linked to as many as 20,000 uh, computer terminals distributed evenly throughout the national economy. 
So consonant with um, Glushkov's greater life work commitments, the network plans reflected a deliberately, and I think this is interesting, decentralized design. And this meant that while Moscow could certainly specify who received which authorization, once they had the authorization, any user could contact any other user on, on the network without direct permission from the mother node. Glushkov intimately understood the advantages of leveraging uh, local knowledge and network designs, having spent so much of his own mathematical career working on related problems and also while ferrying between Moscow and Kiev, uh, the central capital. He jokingly, in fact, referred to the Moscow-Kiev train as his second home. Um, the Ogas project appeared to many state officials and economic planners, at least in the late 1960s, to be the best next response to an old conundrum. As we all know very well, the Soviets had long agreed uh, that communism was the way of the future, but no one uh, since, and perhaps including Marx and Engels, knew exactly how to uh, get that done. For Glushkov, uh, networked computing might just inch the country forward towards uh, what the author, if you don't know this book, I absolutely warmly recommend it, Francis Spufford called uh, The Age of Red Plenty. Mm -hmm. Delightful uh, historical fiction. Um, it was the means by which, uh, for Glushkov, the sluggish pulp-based uh, pulp lifeblood of the command economy, that is, quotas, plans, risk-bending compendiums of industry standards, would transform into the nation's neuronal firings, moving at the sublime speed of electricity. The project, for him, signified no less than the ushering in of electronic socialism, what he called. And, of course, such uh, ambitions required brilliant, committed people willing to throw off old ways of thinking. And some of those people could be found here in the early 1960s in Kiev. On the outskirts of Kiev, Glushkov ran the Institute of Cybernetics for 20 years. Beginning in 1962, he filled the institute with young men and women, the average age of which was about 25. Glushkov and his youth youthful staff dedicated themselves to developing the Ogas and other cybernetic projects in the service of the Soviet state, such as a system of electronic receipts uh, for virtualizing hard currency um, into an online ledger of accounts. And this, of course, was actually still in the early 1960s when it's being proposed. Glushkov, who was known for talking down um, party ideologues uh, by quoting paragraphs of Marx from memory, described his innovation as actually, in fact, a faithful fulfillment of Marx's prophecy of a moneyless socialist future. Unfortunately for Glushkov, the idea of Soviet e-currency stirred up unhelpful anxieties and did not receive committee approval in 1962. Fortunately, at least for his purposes, the Grand Economic Network Project did leave to see another day. These cyberneticists imagined a kind of smart neural network, a nervous system for the Soviet economy. This choice cybernetic analogy between computer network and brain bore its imprint on other computing uh, theory innovations that they developed in Kiev. For example, instead of the so-called von Neumann bottleneck, which limits the amount of transferable data in a computer, Glushkov's team proposed what they called macro piping processing modeled after the simultaneous firings of the many synapses in the human brain. In addition to countless mainframe computer projects that they built, other theoretical schemes, more theoretical schemes, included automata theory, the paperless office, kind of briefcase for both bureaucrat and businessmen alike, and the natural language programming that would allow humans to communicate with computers semantically, not just syntactically. There are the ideas a computer could recognize, for example, that the statement, a chair sits on the ceiling, is nonsense. Um, and, and most ambitiously, Glushkov and his students uh, theorized what they called information immortality, a concept that we might call mind uploading with Arthur C. Clarke or um, uh, Isaac Asimov in hand. On his deathbed, decades later, in fact, Glushkov, with a resonant reflection, be at ease, he soothed her. One day, the light from our Earth will pass by constellations, and on each constellation, we will appear young again. Thus, we will live forever together in the eternities. It's a beautiful uh, analogy for how they were thinking about computer networks as a store of endless information. Another story worth telling. After the workday, the cyberneticists here indulged in a comedy club full of frivolity and merry pranksterism that bordered on, at some times, the outright defiant. No more than a place to vent off steam, their after-hours work club also saw itself as a virtual country, independent of Moscow's rule. They christened this group Kibertonia, 
or Cybertonia, at a New York uh, at a New Year's sorry party in 1960, and organized regular social events such as holiday dances, symposia, and conferences in Kiev and Lviv, and even publishing tongue-in-cheek papers such as quote on wanting to, rem to remain invisible at least to the authorities. Instead of event invitations, the group issued pun-filled faux passports, wedding certificates, newsletters, punch card currency, and even a uh, Cybertonia constitution. In a parody of the Soviet, Soviet Council governance structure, this Cybertonia was governed by a council of robots, at the head of which of that council sat their mascot and supreme leader, a saxophone playing robot. An obvious nod, I think, to the American cultural import of jazz. Let me just note here that I think there's uh, a, some kind of nod needs to be made to the untold and yet comparative countercultural um, 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 histories behind the information age. And thus, as we understand in the scholarship of uh, Fred Turner, who's told the West Coast story, um, that counterculture has long been kin to cyberculture, at least so far as within the Ukrainian context. Uh, the politics of their uh, cyberneticists was the power to both count and to counter other powers. And I think that's a red thread that runs uh, throughout this larger story. Naturally, all of this required money, and lots of it, um, uh, especially Glushkov's Ogos project. That meant convincing the Politburo to give it to them, and so it was that Glushkov found himself in the Kremlin again on October 1st, 1970 hoping to continue the work of Cybertonia and to bring the internet, as it were, to a bedraggled Soviet state. At least one man stood in, so in Glushkov's way, at least for the purposes of my story today, the Minister of Finance, Vasily Garbuzov. Garbuzov did not want any shiny, real-time optimized computer networks governing or informing the state economy. He instead called for simple computers that would flash lights and play music in hen houses to stimulate egg production, as he had once seen during a recent visit in Minsk. Uh, and his motivations were not just born out of a kind of common sense pragmatism, <coughs> for which I would be deeply sympathetic, of course. Instead, he wanted the funding for his own ministry. In fact, rumor holds that he had approached the economic reform prime minister, Alexei Kasigin, in private before the 1970 October 1st gathering, threatening that if his competitor ministry, the Central Statistical Administration, uh, retained control over the Ogas project, then Garbuzov and his own Ministry of Finance would do their best to internally submarine any reform efforts that it might bring about, which is just as they had done to Kasigin's piecemeal liberalization reform efforts five years earlier. So there's precedent for that threat. Glushkov, of course, needed allies to face down Garbuzov and to keep the Soviet internet project alive, but there were none at the meeting, as it happened. The two seats left empty that day were the prime ministers and the technocratic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped there, were the prime minister and the technocratic general secretary, Leonid Brezhnev. These were perhaps the two most powerful men in the Soviet state and likely supporters of the Ogas, but it seems that they chose to be absent that day rather than to face down a ministry mutiny. And so, in the end, Garbuzov successfully convinced the Politburo and, um, that the Ogas project, with its ambitious plans to optimally model and manage information flows in the command economy, was simply too much too soon. The committee, after nearly going the other way, felt it was safer to support Garbuzov, and the still top secret Ogas project was left to languish in review limbo for decades, for another decade. Thus, the forces that brought about the Ogas begin to resemble those that I, th I believe may have eventually undone the Soviet Union as a whole, which is to say the surprisingly informal forms of institutional behavior. There are subversive ministers, status quo inclined bureaucrats, nervous factory managers, confused workers, and, other, and even other economic reformers opposed the Ogas project in particular, in part because it was within the realm of their institutional self-interest to do so. Um, without state funding and oversight, the National Network Project, uh, this project anyways, for ushering in electronic socialism splintered in the 1970s and 1980s into a patchwork of dozens and then hundreds of isolated, non-interoperable factory local area control systems or local area networks. The Soviet state then failed to network the nation, not because it was too rigid or uh, top-down in design, but perhaps because it was too fickle and pernicious in practice. 
And I think there is an irony to this, if I could spin more broadly now about the consequences for, for me as a media theorist. The first global computer networks took root in the US thanks to well-regulated reg state funding and collaborative research environments, while the contemporary and notably independent national network efforts in the USSR floundered due to unregulated competition and institutional infighting among Soviet administrators. As you see, the first global networks emerged thanks to capitalists behaving like cooperative socialists, not socialists behaving like competitive capitalists. In the fate of the Soviet internet, I think we can also glimpse a clear and present warning to the future of our own ne networked environment today. Today, the internet, at least as it's understood as a single global network of networks, largely meant for advancing informational liberty, democracy, and commerce, is in serious, is in serious decline, at least if we accept that formulation. You know, consider, um, excuse me, how uh, companies and states are seeking to silo their online experiences. Um, today, the ubiquitous app that probably all of us have in our pockets right now um, is more of a walled garden for rent seekers than it is uh, public commons for browsers. Or inward looking gravity wells such as Facebook or the uh, Chinese firewall increasingly gobble up sites um, in, uh, that would otherwise link outwards. So too are the heads of France and India, Russia and others, other nations quite understandably eager to internationalize the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers and to enforce local regulations for their citizens. In fact, if you look more broadly, hundreds of non-internet networks have been functioning across corporations and in countries for decades. The future of computing networks undoubtedly holds not one internet, but many distinct online ecosystems. In other words, the future undoubtedly resembles the past. The 20th century features multiple national computer networks clamoring for global status, the Cold War drama of what we might dub here with a wink, Soviet networking, or even in the delightful title of the historian of science at MIT, Slava Gorovich, the Soviet internet, helps to fill out the comparative study of computer networks with a sort of internet negative 1.0 case study. And weighed in the balance of many past and likely future networks, the perception that there is only one single global network of networks is in fact the exception to the historical rule. Given that the Cold War irony at the heart of this story, that cooperative capitalists outmaneuvered uh, competitive socialists, did not play well for the Soviets of yesteryear, perhaps we too should take pause and not be too sure that the internet, internet of tomorrow will fare much better. The anthropologist and philosopher Bruno Latour once quipped that technology is society made durable. By which I think he meant that social values are embedded in technologies. Take, for example, Google's PageRank algorithm. That's the heart of their search bar. Uh, it's deemed democratic, or at least they deem it democratic, because among other factors, it counts links and links to sites making links as votes. And thus, politicians, I wrote this before last week, like politicians with votes, the page with the m most links rank the highest. Just going to let that pause and sit. The internet appears a vehicle of liberty, democracy, and commerce today, in part because it cemented itself, I think, in our popular imagination at that very moment in time when Western values appeared to have triumphed over uh, uh, in the wake of the Cold War in the 1990s. Thus, the Soviet internet story actually helps us to see the reverse of uh, Latour's aphorism, that perhaps so too is society technology made durable, temporary, excuse me. In other words, as our social values shift, so will what appears obvious about technology. The Soviets once embedded values into networks, computer networks, cybernetic collectivism, statist hierarchy, planned economies that seem foreign to the modern observer. And so too will the values that modern uh, listeners and users attach to the internet strike future observers as strange. T network technologies will surely endure and evolve, even as our fondest social assumptions pass into the dustbin of history. Glushkov's story is also a stirring reminder, I think, to the investor classes and those agents of technological change that astonishing genius, imaginative foresight, and political acumen are not enough to change the world. Supporting institutions, and this is the signal lesson from this, lesson, uh, from this book, make all the difference. This is an express lesson of the Soviet experience and a media environment today, continuously mined for digital data and other forms of privacy exploitation. The institutional networks that undergird the making of computer networks and their cultures are both vital 
and far from singular, and I think we need much more work in this vein. While computer networks projects and the promoters will continue, I imagine, to pedestal broader futures publicly, this is a reminder that private institutional forces, unless checked, will continue to capitalize on surveillance networks committed to making themselves privy to our lives. And here I can say more about what I do in the conclusion with Hannah Arendt and sort of his, her political theory, but it's a way of moving beyond the Cold War binaries and economic liberal language altogether. But one gesture towards that is that perhaps that is what privacy in the end is really about, the sweeping power of institutional, omnivorous institutions to pry into our lives, not just the individual rights to protect against that privation. And again, the Soviet case study reminds us that the US National Security Agency's domestic spying program, the Microsoft Cloud, and a host of other uh, omnivorous uh, information projects partake in a much longer 20th century tradition of general secretariats committed to privatizing personal and public information for their own institutional gain. In other words, we should not take too much comfort in, in, in this end of the 20th century dialogue. For in fact, uh, the, uh, or from the fact that we think the global internet first evolved thanks to cooperative so capitalists, not competitive socialists. Rather, the story of the internet, of the Soviet internet, as it were, is a reminder that we internet users will enjoy no guarantees that the private interests propping up the internet today will behave any better than the greater forces whose unwillingness to cooperate not only spelled the end of Soviet electronic socialism, but threatens, I think, to uh, end the current chapter in our networked age. Thank you.